This is Dr. Karen, and you are listening to the DeFacto Leaders Podcast on the Bee Podcast Network, where I share up-to-date, evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help pediatric therapists, educators, and aspiring school leaders design services that support social, emotional, and academic growth and set kids up for success in adulthood. Whether you want to learn effective strategies for your therapy session or classroom, be an influential leader on your team, or find creative ways to use your skills to advance in your career, I've got you covered. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 180 of the DeFacto Leaders Podcast on the Bee Podcast Network. Many of my colleagues working in the public sector are skeptical of companies selling products to school districts. I've felt some of this skepticism myself as I've seen certain approaches gain traction because they're well-marketed, yet not evidence-based. So it's understandable to me that people would question the motives of companies selling products, especially in the for-profit space. But the huge elephant in the room, of course, is that my company, Dr. Karen LLC, is a for-profit ed tech company. I've also spent a fair amount of time interacting with people who either work for larger ed tech companies or curriculum companies or who have started one themselves. And I found that most of them are therapists administrators or teachers or people who used to be in one of those roles and they simply felt inspired to create something and they're trying to make a living doing something that matters. I'd add that this would also describe many of the hosts on the Bee Podcast Network, which is why I wanted to invite one of the network co-founders, Ross Romano, to DeFacto Leaders to talk about his experiences coaching ed tech and education-related startup founders. Ross Romano has worked with over 100 companies and nonprofit organizations in the education space and collaborated with countless schools, districts, and educators. Ross is the founder and CEO of September Strategies, an award-winning consulting firm helping leaders and organizations connect vision to decision through coaching, strategic advisement, and marketing consulting. Ross is also the co-founder of the Bee Podcast Network, a media company producing over 40 podcasts, reaching more than 50,000 educators and parents every month. He is also strategic advisor for the American Consortium for Equity and Education and the founding program chair of the Consortium's Excellent in Equity Awards. Prior to starting September Strategies, Ross was managing director of Mind Rocket Media Group, a K-12 marketing firm. Previously, he was head of communications for ASCD, working closely with the organization's authors, product developers, administrator members, constituent leaders, and advocacy teams on a diverse array of initiatives. Ross has created and or hosted dozens of podcast series, written a number of white papers and ebooks, and is a contributing editor for Educate AI Magazine, and has been a contributor to Entrepreneur, The Learning Council, Ed Circuit, Access and Equity, Pre-K through 12, and more. Ross serves on the advisory boards for Shenandoah University's Transformative Leadership Program and Morning Brew Learning. In 2023, he was listed as a top 10 leadership coach of the year and was profiled by CIO Views as one of the visionary leaders transforming education. In this conversation, we discuss business advice that creates ethical dilemmas for companies selling products to schools. And can companies stand for equity without sacrificing product quality and customer service? Who is the true end user when products are sold to schools? And when a product isn't resulting in increased student outcomes, is it really just about the quality of the product? And finally, who is making purchasing decisions for schools and what matters to them? 
Be sure to check the show notes for all the places you can go to connect with Ross and learn all about the podcast he hosts, as well as some of the other work that he's doing. And also be sure to check out the School of Clinical Leadership, my program that helps related service providers put executive functioning support in place in collaboration with their school teams. You can learn more about the School of Clinical Leadership at drkarendudakbrannon.com backslash clinical leadership. Now, please enjoy this conversation with Ross Romano. Today, I am joined by Ross Romano, one of the co-founders of the B Podcast Network. So thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. So you have a lot of projects that you're doing in a long history. So maybe we can start off by just tell us a little bit about your background and then some of the things that you're working on now. Sure. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. But uh, as you mentioned, I co-founded the B Podcast Network with Jethro Jones. And I believe Jethro has been on the show here before. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, so in addition to working behind the scenes to help us, uh, recruit shows to join the network, working with our sponsors, advertisers, and partners. I also host uh, a couple of shows, one called The Authority Podcast, where I interview authors from the education world, from leadership, Wall Street Journal bestseller types, all about their strategies for success for leaders. And I also host sideline sessions in which I talk to sports coaches. I talk to coaches from the NFL and NBA, the Olympics, um, college coaches, high school coaches of all different sports. And uh, really for, you know, providing insights for those who are coaching at the high school and, and youth levels, right? And so they can hear things that are working for others. Um, and then uh, I also have a company called September Strategies, which is a consulting firm. I'd say we help organizations and leaders on the journey from vision to decision. Um, we help with everything from overall uh, organizational strategy to content marketing, thought leadership, sales enablement, um, kind of across the board, all the things that help companies in the education space uh, really get to uh, the point where they are able to feel like they're they're making the strategic decisions to advance their mission. Um, exclusively education world there. And, and uh, prior to that, I was managing another agency. So I, I did the math at one point and realized that I've done some type of project with uh, more than 100 different companies in the, wow. uh, the K to, to 12 and, and a little bit of higher ed space over the past several years. So um, viewing that from those languages and then working really closely with school districts and, and administrators and, and educators of all different roles to try to move things forward. Yeah. So lots of places we could go there, but I know that what we were talking about before we hit record was just both of our experiences with the ed tech space. So I know yours is from, from a lot of the work that you've done as a coach consultant Mine was more, well, I consider myself an ed tech company because I offer educational products and learning learning products for educators and clinicians. So by definition, I am an ed tech company, even though I'm very small. It's just me and an assistant and the occasional consultant. And then I know um, this last this last year when I was interviewing for the position that I currently have now, I was talking with a lot of people because I was considering going to work for an ed tech company. And so you learn a lot about when you ask people, tell me about your job and what you do. You learn a lot about the the inside of those companies where they're focusing on curriculum and technology. But but I know that you have worked with ed tech in, in that space and are currently working in that space in a different way. So can you share a little bit about some of the things that you've you're you're doing I and I mean I can we can go into specifics but yeah maybe we could start there sure yeah overall I mean I think it's it's worth uh saying explicitly all the work I do that my focus is and the, the companies and, and nonprofits that I work with um the focus is all around ec- advancing equity and access so I'm always looking to work with organizations, whether it's individual founders a lot of times or much larger companies who have clear commitments um, to moving forward, you know, access and opportunity for all students, all educators. Um, 
So that's one of the big things <laughs> related to that that I've been thinking about a lot lately is looking at from the school system side, right? And how do we continue to incentivize innovation to happen within education and specifically for new founders, new companies, um, and even you know existing companies to continue to invest in uh, providing products and services to schools. Because anybody who's just a general business advisor mm -hmm. would never advise that you should create a product that you sell to schools because uh -huh. the red tape is... Yeah horrendous uh -huh. right the funding yep. landscape you know selling it's it, selling to to schools is, is really the hardest thing to do it and really of is course, right, <laughs> so of course the there's ed tech to schools <laughs> um ed tech that's sold directly to parents and there's some of that um and, and that's more of a direct to consumer and, and there's things that mm -hmm. that happen outside of it um and sometimes that might be the best way to go about it. And, and a lot of times, again, like for companies that are struggling in the school space, they're advised to sort of pivot to that. Um, the challenge of that being that that can potentially even exacerbate equity concerns versus. Oh, close yeah. So them. they're saying you're saying they're they're selling to schools, but they're being advised to pivot to the parenting space. Right. Companies that, that may be B2, B2C. I have had business consultants mm -hmm. tell me that. And I've also had business <laughs> consultants tell me, oh, well, you're, why don't you focus on the the big spenders? <laughs> you know, like, right. why don't you focus on the, um, I don't know what, what the, what's the word? Like, like luxury, like be a luxury brand. That's, that's what's sold mm -hmm. in the entrepreneur space. Like beginning, I would say probably business consultants that, don't have as much experience, they tend to do that because your job is easier as a consultant. If you are working with somebody who is selling, you know, something that's high end, their margins are going to be, the selling is a lot easier. I mean, it's just, it's just how it is. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's it's, it's makes business sense. Right. And uh -huh. understanding the economics of startups and the fact that the vast majority of these founders are bootstrapping it <laughs> they're not, they don't they're not just sitting on a whole bunch of investment capital and, and um millions of dollars that they can use to take as long as they want to start generating any kind of profit right mm -hmm. i would never fault anybody in that position for saying look i believe in my product i believe we can provide i need to go the route that's going to allow me to to actually make a living here right, right. Mm -hmm. um so it's more about you know how do the the school systems work more productively with them to say okay a lot of us have you know needs that we're still needing to fill right things that we still need to improve um we have certain companies that we're working with that we feel like we have a really good relationship, really good products. We have other products we either never used or they didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know instead of continuing to make that a challenge how do we engage better in tandem and uh, and look at okay if we want if we know that we share the goals of improving teaching and learning and we know that it's going to require more and better ideas to to make that happen as needs evolve uh, how do we keep that brain power Mm -hmm. here <laughs> and innovating in the schools um, versus either, you know, going the direct to consumer route, even with a tech or saying, look, I have the technical expertise to create this great product that leverages AI. I can create something totally different that has nothing to do with education. Right? <laughs> yeah. And again, you know, it, and it's, it's about how do we make it so that it is good for everyone? Uh, for that innovation to be happening and then for educators to be getting the tools that they need to do what they need to do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I have so many different things I can, I can say about what you just said, but I think I've definitely been tempted myself to go outside of, I would say education, healthcare, special ed, like 
I'm kind of all in all of those different spaces or, or maybe I would say public sector, or social services. And every time I do it, I just can't stick with it. Like I just don't, the, I don't know, maybe the why isn't there for me. Like I'm just not as excited about it. And I always have this, the, the internal struggle of like, okay, I know that if you go and do something else that you can make money and generate more income. But I mean, I, I think that the thing that I've said to myself is if I don't do something in this space, like who, who will, if everybody goes and sells luxury products, who's left to help people in education. So, I, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I landed, where I was like, okay, I'm just, I'm just staying here. Like it's, it's what I want to be doing. So I definitely, definitely can, uh, th there's a lot of people who are, who have it, uh, with, with some of the things that they're trying to build with, as far mm -hmm. as technology, because what I do, it's, it's a lot, a lot simpler than some of the tools that some people are trying to build. And yeah, I, I feel for them. I know that I know a lot of them who I aren't paying themselves a salary and mm -hmm. All kinds of things. <laughs> well, a case in point to to your example of how you know anybody who's not in the education world, right, and who's this isn't this isn't necessarily their field or their calling, thinks that we're crazy for doing it. Yeah, I um I once uh, was working with a an ed tech company that had been operating in the school space for decades, right, and they had some. Um, some new leadership come in that decided that their growth potential was in creating a direct -to consumer product. They they weren't mm -hmm. leaving the school space, but they thought, okay, we already have all the content here that we need to kind of repackage this and sell it directly to parents. Maybe it's parents that, you know, just want some additional acceleration or remediation for their kids at home. And but in order to make it make financial sense it had to be a pretty expensive product. And they had also hired at the time a digital marketing agency that did not specialize in education. So it wasn't necessarily even versed in, in all of the things that we care about. So this was a company whose mission was all around equity, right? And, and so the people the, doing their marketing were not education. The people who were doing this facet of their marketing, at least, mm -hmm. um, which included, yeah, you know, social <laughs> media marketing, et cetera, were explicitly targeting parents in high wealth areas. Right? So they always tell you, know, you to do that. And <laughs> I luckily I had some insight into this and I was able to put my hand up and say, uh, you know, this is not exactly consistent with our, our equity mission here. And, um, you know, to their credit, they did get rid of that firm. And <laughs> it wasn't necessarily because of that as much as just not, not really having the expertise and the thing. And, and, but the point was that, yeah, I mean, in order to be able to package that as a, as a, product for parents it had to be a luxury product it was something that was i forget you know but let's say it was hundreds of dollars per month right for this and so clearly that's only you know not everybody can afford that and it's not to say that anybody of course is in the wrong for creating something that is enrichment that parents can provide to their kids um but it's saying if that's the only way to create a product that you can make any money off of, <laughs> then obviously, you know, the dollars uh, in that case are going to say that only so many kids are going to get access to that and the rest of them aren't. And, um, you know, and if we're, that's just not really going to work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's, it's always such a subtle balance because um, so like I'm, I do sell to schools, but I'm mostly direct to consumer. So most of the people who buy my products are, I'd say the largest, the largest group is speech pathologists, but I do get teachers and occasionally parents and some other clinicians as well. And um, 
I know that the way that my products are priced is at the higher end of what they would be paying for continuing education. And I have had business consultants tell me they're like, you are never going to be profitable with those prices. Like you have to charge like, like I've had people come in and tell me to like add a zero at the end of my price point. And I'm like, that's, and then they tell you that you have a money mindset issue if you say, you know what, that's not my market. Like they're never going to be able to do that. And I'm already like, it's already challenging and I'm trying to make it as accessible to as many people as possible with different, you know, payment plans and things like that. Or so, yeah, like it's, it's definitely an, an ethical dilemma. And I, to what you were saying about the equity issues with selling to parents, that is the primary thing that marketing and business strategy people have told me. They're like, you go after the the parents in wealthy areas. And um, I, I think, you know, again, if at least if you are selling to the clinicians that are working with students, you are you are having an impact on the students who who need those services, at least if you're, you know, you're supporting, you're supporting public education and, and, and private education too. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that would be involved in, especially if you have a podcast and you have other free, free channels where you can connect with people as well. So, yeah, I mean, the, the equity piece, I, I think that that is, if you're, I can understand having different, different aspects or different ways that you help people like, um, do you follow over meet Sadie at all? Not that I can think of. I know, like he he kind of talks about how like he does have he's actually the person I, I joined one of his courses. It was the very first course I ever took to learn how to start my business. And it's how it's how I got started back in 2015. And he also has a lot for personal finance. So again, he has like different options. Like he has some things that are super high end for people who can afford it, but then he has a book that you can purchase or like a, a free podcast. So, I mean, I think he's finding a way to balance it a little bit, but I know that it, it just like, it gets challenging when the message that business owners and startups are told is you got to go after just you know, you have to be a luxury brand or you're not successful. Because again, like you said to me, it's like, if you can only sell that, then maybe like, maybe you need to rethink your strategy and your mission. Right. And, and, you know, and this is, a, I mean, and, and you know, giving uh, people who maybe work in schools and districts or clinicians um, some insight into what happens on that entrepreneurial side. And yeah. This is something that 90 eight percent of uh of entrepreneurs and founders struggle with initially is pricing yeah and when you yeah. actually do the math on it it almost always needs to you know be priced higher than you initially thought and most people yeah, find that out much too late after mm -hmm. they've been selling and lo basically losing money on what mm -hmm. they're selling or wondering why can't I make more money? Because if you want something that's a really high quality product uh, and something that comes with really good customer service, right? Oh and, yeah. And, that's and the hands hard on. Part. There's you, a lot you've of got to do everything yourself. Right. There's can't a high cost to delivering <laughs> that. It's not, you, we don't want companies that are just built to scale because oh, we can just sell it digitally. And once people buy it, we, we no longer have any obligation yeah. to them, right? That's not that's not probably going to get the job done. Um, so, you know, and you're referencing a dilemma that really you shouldn't have to be in the dilemma of having to decide between, okay, should I do the thing that makes the business sense or the thing that's in alignment with the impact I want to have? We yeah. need to get those incentives aligned <laughs> and mm -hmm. say, look, you know, each person who is creating something should make their decision on what they want to create based on who they want to serve, what impact they want to have. And if that's something that's a consumer product, or if that's something that's an institutional product or whatever, 
they should be making their decision based on those factors, not based on, well, this one, I'm probably, it's, you know, it's going to fail um, because the infrastructure isn't there. And realistically, like, this is a, not universal and it's a little oversimplified, but I kind of, over the years, have um, had this tipping point that I identified for, you know, anti companies that sell to schools, particularly if we're talking about curriculum products or things that are implemented at least at the mm-hmm at the school level, um, even if it's, whether it's supplemental or core curriculum or whatever, but that they need to, once they can get to 10 paying clients, 10 schools that are paying full price Mm -hmm. to license that product, they can sustain, you know, they can grow from there. Yeah. But getting to that first 10, getting past the ones that want to do a uh, a pilot that mm. they're paying, either they're not paying or they're paying, you know, so like some, sometimes what we would instead. refer to in the B to C world as like a beta test or in B to C, you would do a free trial, right? Yeah. There's the freemium model of, OK, you get certain features without paying and then yeah. you have to pay. And that model um, again, like it works for trying to gobble up market share. And then once you have enough people that are reliant on your product, you can start to, you know, roll back yeah. on what's available. I know, I know for people free. have done it that way before. Right. Yeah. And a lot of companies um, did a lot of that, particularly during the pandemic when schools were remote and, uh, and there was, a, a, you know, a little bit more of a free for all, right? A lot of schools weren't really prepared for that. So there was a lot of burden on teachers to find different things to try. Yeah. And a lot of tools were made available free during that time. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, what companies were able to do after that, there were some of them who grew to that scale through practices that just weren't sustainable. Like they weren't really able to staff the the actual, you know, customer success teams needed and they ended up sort of falling apart. Customer service just took, it's like, Mm -hmm. there were certain companies where it was non-existent. I remember some of the softwares that I use for my business. It's like, they used to have 24 hour chat support and you were having a problem, you could, and then it was gone and it was email tickets and you'd wait like three days and, you know, it wasn't, they just, I, I think, you know, on the other end where I would defend the companies a little bit more, just, just understanding, you know, and again, I'm so much smaller than a lot of these companies, even the the smaller ones that you probably work with where like the, if you, again, if you want high quality customer service, it, it's really hard for companies to pay for staff or right. if you want to make sure that you're, you have a high quality product and mm-hmm. like, I think we could kind of get into some of the specifics about how some ed tech companies are set up, but, but again, just what, what does it actually cost to run this business? And then what does it cost to be able to pay yourself a salary beyond that? And I don't think people realize that. And I know that within some of the, the like clinical business groups that I'm in or like, you know, with educators, um, people will, there's a lot of judgment, you know, from people Mm -hmm. who, who haven't started businesses of, you know, about, you know, decisions that people make or things that you see from the outside where you don't know the inner workings. And, um, and, and a lot of times it's just teachers and therapists and maybe former school administrators who are trying to make things better and left and now left all the security of, of a job and maybe don't have a salary. (laughs) Um, And so they're, they were trying to make this change and now they're getting a lot of judgment from the people who they're trying to help. So I've seen that as well, um, which is, which is unfortunate, but Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I would, it would be interesting. I know that you work with a lot of startups, but I know that a lot of the partnerships that we have on the network are bigger companies like one of them, I think I wanted to make sure I got this in, but I excel as one of our sponsors. And I know that sometimes there is from these bigger companies, there's some skepticism about like, 
who, how are, how are they being made? Are they actually quality products? Do we have a bunch of IT people or, who are putting this together or are there people who have expertise in education? Um, but I remember when I was in the schools, we used IXL. Um, that's something that's used in the community where I live. And there was this one student who he was, he needed response to intervention for math. And I remember that we, we like, we watched this, the data throughout the year and he just like, he sat there and he worked on it and we just saw the scores go up. And then the student was able to like, he, he was, we're kind of debating on whether or not we needed a special education evaluation. And he was working on math facts and it was scaffolded. And like, it was something that the teachers would have had to deliver, but they found a way to deliver it in a way that was exactly what he needed at the right time with the right structure and hierarchy. And he was able to just like, again, do response to intervention like you're supposed to. And so it was just a really really cool case study because the student just sat there and was able to do it himself. Like, yeah. and the teacher was involved, but it wasn't like, it, it wasn't a, as big of a lift as some of the other interventions we were doing. So yeah. Um, so shout out to IXL, one of our yeah. sponsors, but I think where I wanted to go with this, I guess let's maybe talk about how ed tech companies are set up. And then I wanted to come back to something that one of my previous guests said to me about like, who is your end user? So we, I want to come back to that question, but, but yeah, right. in your experience, like who, who's making these products like at the bigger companies? Yeah. In my, in my experience, it's uh, it's very difficult to get almost any job at these companies without it is. having, I ha tried having been a, a practicing I educator. <laughs> um, I mean, most of them, if you work, you know, even their people that work in communications and marketing and sales, they're former educators. Um, they're really prioritized hiring former educators, not only because they believe in the skill set and th that educators have, but because mm -hmm. they know, you know, they know the the challenges, right? And, and so my simplest advice to people in schools would be trust your direct experience with these companies, right? Mm -hmm. Like who are the people that you work with that you have touch points with? How are those interactions? You know, are they helping you or are they not, right? Versus uh, worrying about what we think. Um, and then you'll find that some of them do a marvelous job with these things and there's others who don't and you can make your own decisions about that um but yeah they really are for the most part made up of of former educators who made a decision at whatever point it was that this was the next step for them maybe they were a teacher in a school where you know, they just decided it was time to move on from that particular school and they ended up going into the ed tech route versus going to a new school or leaving the profession. Mm -hmm. yep. Maybe they were mm -hmm. somebody who just, you know, got to a point where they they felt like it was a better move for them for lifestyle reasons or financially or whatever. But there are people who say they they believe in the work they do in education, right? They want to stay in education. And they see this as part of being a part of the solution and that we're all on the same team here trying to create the same outcomes and one doesn't work without the other. Mm -hmm. um, that totally goes to the point of, you know, I think there's a lot of educators who have some misgivings about, uh, I think particularly at tech companies versus other yeah. education providers. Tech feeling companies like, in general, because- I right. mean, there's the really big ones that that do have a lot of money. Um, so it, it's hard to it's hard to parse out wh which are the good ones sometimes uh, because there are when it comes to curriculum companies, a lot of them have become ed tech companies because we've gone digital. And so some of them used to be curriculum textbook, and now they're a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's a fear you know, or a perception that certain things, whether it's um, relates to personalized learning or um, other types of tools that 
students are able to receive instruction separate from the time that they're directly spending with their teacher, Mm -hmm. that there's an objective here of replacing teachers. But number Uh one, I've never, and I've worked with a lot of companies, (laughs) and I've never worked with one of them that thought that their work um, could be successful without highly qualified educators in those right. schools, right? Well, and that their mission with that was example that I gave, like it was what he did on IXL was the practice of certain skills so that when he went into the math class with the teacher, he had automaticity. Like that's, you know. it's filling the gaps because right. someone couldn't sit there with him to to do those facts. And we had a tool that the teacher could use to supplement what she was doing. Right. And it gave the student an opportunity to continue learning during a time when I couldn't get one-on-one time with the teacher because there's a lot of students and only so many people. It gives the teachers real-time data and insights that they can use to know what's going to help that student best. Um, And, you know, there also is a point of, look, this, this varies, you know, state to state, district to district, but there's a nationwide teacher shortage. And mm-hmm. it's not going to be solved in the immediate future, right? I mean, we hopefully things can be done to to alleviate it, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, there's a lot of schools and districts out there that are having to supplement the teachers they have. A lot of them are going to work for the ed tech companies because there's some <laughs> of that work life balance is there. <laughs> I'm going to take a quick break here to talk about Language Therapy Advanced Foundations, my program that helps SLPs create a system for language therapy by focusing on the essential components of vocabulary that help students develop a foundation to support strategic planning, to support high-level processing, and to give them those vocabulary and syntactic skills they need that are going to support literacy and life outcomes. As a clinician, especially if you are in the schools, it can be really difficult to know where to start. In fact, that's probably the biggest pain point that I hear from school SLPs is, where the heck do I start? What is my hierarchy? How can I prioritize all these possible skills when my students have so many different needs and I have so many different people telling me all these different messages about where I should be focusing? What I do in Language Therapy Advanced Foundations is give you a five-component framework that supports those language skills that are going to build the foundation that students need to support their academic skills, their vocational skills, their reading and writing skills, all those things that are going to help them be successful in school and in life beyond school. That five-component framework focuses on vocabulary as the core umbrella area where we are supporting students. And the elements that fit under that umbrella are orthography, morphology, phonology, semantics, and syntax. So we're building a foundation for students to have that high-level processing, to be able to understand sentences at the word level, at the sentence level, and to be able to formulate complex thoughts for high-level strategic planning. To learn more about the program, you can go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language therapy. There's certainly certain realities that that make some educators decide that that's a better career move for them. And, mm-hmm. and like, you know, understanding how the system works, um, that's something that makes a lot of logical sense, right? And, um, but there's also just, you know, economic realities that go far beyond education when it comes to rural areas and, you know, what, what, what's, housing availability there and what and you know, so there's a lot of things that aren't aren't exclusive to schools that says okay if i'm a superintendent or i'm an administrator mm-hmm. of any sort my job is to make sure that every student that's enrolled in my care is able to get access to high quality curriculum and instruction and sometimes that that uh requires a variety of options but yeah, I mean, every, I think every single 
company out there that's serving schools wants to be in partnership um, with educators, working closely with them, and um, and and the more that hopefully schools are aware of that, and then mm-hmm. can you know can seek to foster those types of partnerships, the better it's going to be for them. Certainly, the better it is for students because look that the feedback loop is invaluable, right? Mm-hmm. The the information that a company can get about what's working really well about its product, what's not working, what's happening in their community, um, what questions do parents have? What are the things that they're uncertain about? Particularly in this day of high stakes testing and, you know, and parents of elementary students being stressed about how something they're doing in, you know, second or third grade is going to impact their opportunities for college down the road. Um, There's a lot of things that are meant to be formative or diagnostic that people are worried about. Is is this something that is going to be used against, you know, summatively or against the student later on? And it's because of all these different dynamics at play. So the better the communication is about the purpose of these tools and these assessments and and the better um, that you know certainly the the common understanding is of how to best utilize them to say our focus here is on growth Mm -hmm. and as the better information we have about what each student needs the better we can make sure that we're doing the things that help them grow Mm -hmm. Um, then everybody is able to understand that and know the role that they play but it's not it's certainly not surprising that there's a lot of confusion about this stuff because there are so many pressure points coming from all directions. Yeah. So one thing that you were saying about how most of the people who work at these companies are not claiming to replace teachers with AI or with devices and technology. They're ideally just wanting to give additional tools to facilitate what's happening with, you know, real human interaction that's going on. And I think one example, it was a a guest that that Jethro connected me with, uh, Matthew Chaucey from CareerView XR, and they do virtual reality um, experiences for students to explore different career options. And you know, and on the surface, it sounds like, well, well, wouldn't it be better for them to have in-person experiences? Well, of course, but what do you do for those students in rural districts that have transportation issues? And I mean, even when I was talking with Matthew, he said, we're not trying to re- replace in-person experiences. We're trying to supplement. And maybe in theory, what you could do is if you have these virtual experiences, it could help you to to fine tune or maybe be more planful about the things that you do plan in person because maybe you've given students an opportunity to explore things. And so now you can say, hey, when we do a field trip or when we do some kind of a career fair at school, students have already been doing something up up until this point so that we can prepare better. So it's it's a supplement. And and he was very transparent about that because I, you know, I asked him a lot of things about what, what was possible with some of the platforms they offer. So uh, I think that's, that's an important distinction. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask about was the concept of who is the end user. So any kind of tech company or really any company that's going to be talking about product development, you use the word user. So Like, who is your customer avatar? Who are you selling to? And so I have a question about that too, as far as like who's actually making the purchasing decisions. But when you're thinking about selling products to schools, I think sometimes people will will say, okay, it's for kids. The end user is would be the kids. But I actually was talking with someone previously when she was, Uh, This is a reading specialist who has experience with change management. And she was saying that when you're making big decisions about curriculum in a district or a product, that the end user is the teacher, not the students. Because if you're making the end user the students, you're not really thinking about how can I 
take good teaching and add to it by giving teachers the tools that they need, even if the student is interfacing with the product. So I thought that was a really interesting point and I had never thought of it that way. And I'm curious, what what do you think about that point of view? And like, just what, as far as the mindset that you've maybe had when working with some of the companies that you're coaching? Yeah, I, I don't think that companies should fail to consider the student experience certainly but i do think that we have to we have to trust the perspective and the expertise of the teachers who are working with them directly who are able to observe how students are responding to a curriculum product or any other kind of product and you know being able to to solicit that feedback i always approach it um kind of in in three buckets where it's purchaser and user and influencer audiences mm, so most of the time you know in schools or districts right the ad, some administrator is the purchaser the one who signs off and says yeah. like we're, curriculum director or superintendent were the ones that were right. brought up we're, the most. we're allocating our budget to this and that's the decision maker that might be who uh, might be the, the person that the sales team is interfacing with but mm-hmm. For yeah. most things, that's not the person who actually uses it. Normally, it's happening more at the classroom level. So it's teachers who are using it hands-on or other, you know, specialists and practitioners within the school. Um, but then also, you know, that is an influencer audience because we want them to be advocating and saying, mm-hmm. look, I have experience with this product. Here, here were the challenges with it. Or this one was really good. Also, parents could be influencers for a lot of things. Um, there's a variety of different roles who are the people who are not the users whose perspective we want to hear. And so trying to bucket them by who are those different groups and what would they want to know about this? Well, like, what are their pain points? What questions mm-hmm. do they have? What would they be concerned about? What, what do they want to solve? And then are we communicating how this helps them with that are we addressing yeah. that and almost almost always you know and there's exceptions but almost always the answers to those questions exist in the products that have been created and in the you know the the process that's gone behind them but they haven't always been articulated, right? So yeah. saying, okay, we know what we have here, but we need to make sure that we are telling each each group here what are the things that that they are needing to know about. Um, other times, there are gaps, and then that provides an opportunity to go to the product teams and say, okay, we need to develop this piece of it, or we need to provide other resources around the implementation, right? FAQs, community yeah. webinars, you know, d- different things to say. We know that, for example, there's a tool that's used in the classroom. It's the, the curriculum director is the one who's making the decision to purchase it, but the teacher is the one who's using it And also the teacher is the person who's going to be in position to have to answer parents' questions about it. Mm. Oh yeah, the parents too. (laughs) So I'm the one who, I didn't decide to use this tool, but I have to answer the questions about it. So one, what resources can we provide ahead of time to enable proactive communication from the school so that hopefully a lot of that information gets out to, you know, to address their the questions parents. before they ask them, or at least shows the intentionality and the the you know the thoughtfulness and the goals behind this, so that okay, I still have some questions, but I understand that there's a plan here and that it was thoughtful, and and, yeah. and I have a, you know benefit of the doubt. And then also, like, are we equipping the teachers with that information to say, okay, here's the things that we want to make sure you're ready to talk about? It's all of those things contribute a lot to the eventual success <laughs> of what happens in that classroom with that product. And none of them are the product, right? So you yeah. can have a really good product, but if you're missing those other pieces, um, it could just get to the point or, you know, 
and it also relates to professional development. Yeah. And a lot of the companies do have a professional development piece as well. Like they'll have their product and they'll have a professional development team as well that will go and train people to use the product or, or online resources or, or whatever it is. So, yeah. Yeah. And it was, I mean, I recently, yeah, for one of our other podcasts here, um, spoke with Preet and Shah, who's the founder of a company called pedagogy.cloud. And what they do is they, I mean, one of the big things they do is they provide professional development around AI product. And he had recently written an op-ed for Ed Week saying, basically, um, you know, I was an AI optimist, but now I'm worried that it's making teacher burnout worse. And kind of the mm. core of it was nothing is being taken off of their plates to create space for the professional learning to really understand how to use these new tools and feel like they've mastered them. And so it's an issue at the school to say, if even if the companies are providing all the professional learning you need, there's only so much time that exists. So what are we clearing out to create time for this to do? And also are the decision makers doing a good enough job of communicating to those end users to understand here's why we're getting this tool, here's what it does, here's the learning around how to use it. Um, because there's a lot of things that get purchased and then they, they don't get used and they sit on the shelf and that doesn't serve anybody because it means that the district wasted money, the students didn't get the benefit of whatever that tool was, neither did the teachers, the company isn't going to get a renewal and also they're not making the impact they want to make, right? But that happens when there's just not enough time to go around. Um, but there probably was a good thought behind that. But if it doesn't get communicated out and then there's not a, you know, a, a consistent through line in place for saying, how do we take this all the way through to successful usage? Um, and, but you know what? Again, it's it's a really important thing for people on the industry side to feel like they're able to voice those concerns too and say, look, these are the things we're trying to help with and these are the things that aren't working right now. And it doesn't mean that it's never going to work or that the products are no good or that you should just give up on it. But it's saying, if we are partners in this, if we're working together, we each need to be honest with each other and so that we can fix these things. When I was, uh, I think I, I talked to, she was a customer service representative. I'm not sure what her official job title was, but she was a teacher. Then she was a principal. And then she, uh, then she went to work for an ed tech company. And her role was that she was the customer service support and she worked primarily with the superintendents. And she really liked it, but she said that she would just kind of, they would sell the product and then she would be following up with them and say, like pull reports of student data and say like, here's how your district is doing. And and then they would just collaborate and troubleshoot to see if any training was needed and just, you know, they would just, just answer, she would just answer questions for the superintendents. And she said, the superintendents, they want the data. Like that's what I know that that's what they need when I show up to those calls to support them. So that's how she was thinking about it. And and it is when you have people who are making the purchasing decisions, they do have different pain points. They have different things that they're thinking about on a day to day basis. And mm -hmm. I I understand what you're saying about the the decision maker versus the influencer, because it affects your marketing, it affects your customer service. And there's a lot of things I could say about that. But I am curious, because when I was talking to people who were on the marketing side and the product development side of companies that were making, for example, supplemental literacy products, um, it, it made me happy to hear that a lot of them were all focused on aligning with the science of reading. Hopefully mm -hmm. they were actually doing that. I know it's become a buzzword now, but there is this side of, we have to make sure this is aligned with the research, but then there's this other side, which is the marketing department that's always saying, 
well, this is what the market wants. And that's two different kinds of research. There's empirical research on what are effective teaching practices. And then there's marketing research, which says this is what is going, this is what the market wants and and this is what will help the company generate revenue, which you would hope that those things would be aligned. I don't know. I don't know if they always are, but I am curious when you have been interacting with the decision makers, like what, what are those decision-making factors? What are they asking for when they're thinking about curriculum products? Like what is, what is driving their decisions? Because I, I know it's very different for somebody who is in the field directly working with students versus somebody who's looking at the data from more of a macro lens. Yeah, I mean the, the the overarching answer is um does it help us increase our test scores, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there's a number of different things that they might need to do. You know, each district has certain things that they're struggling more with or mm -hmm. that they have different gaps on, so they might be looking to address different things within that, but all of it comes back to, you know, our students are at this proficiency level in math and reading, and we want something that's going to get them to a higher proficiency level. Or um, there also are other pieces around, I think, coming to an understanding of that there is more possibility around being able to deliver uh, a wider array of, uh, you know, access to, to different courses and more curriculum um, beyond what they traditionally have been able to because there hasn't been enough demand. You know, we only have five students who want this class. We can't pay a mm -hmm. teacher to teach it for only yeah. five students. So what's another way of being able to go about that? Um, there's an ongoing process of redefining what career connected learning looks like and college and yeah. career readiness and mm -hmm. saying, okay, you know, what, what really is that profile of a graduate? I mean, what are the skills and competencies and knowledge and exposure that students should be getting before they graduate so that they can make the decisions and do what they want to do to be successful in their life? So a lot of that might not directly tied to test scores, but it could look like you rent reference of career view XR, the career exploration. Um, you know, and a lot of companies even at the might school. be able to offer ways to assess those kinds of things. Like I can remember, so, so Jen Perry that you connected mm -hmm. me with, I mean, that is, that is what she measures is connectedness and engagement. And mm -hmm. it's about the whole learner. And so that is part of what she does in her work in the ed tech space is figure out how do we measure how connected students are to their learning. So it's, I mean, there there are, I'm sure there's test scores and specific academic numbers as well, but there's other things besides just, just the traditional things that we think about. Yeah, there's, uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's become a lot more, I, I don't, I don't know what the numbers are on it, but certainly having a, a uniquely clarified portrait of a graduate or profile of graduates so that including things like social emotional mm -hmm. learning yeah. and career connected learning and all these and so there, that's things that districts want to address um but you know the most urgent stuff always comes down to whatever dictates funding yeah so if, yeah you know particularly is, in the public schools right if, if there's there's certain metrics they have to hit to access certain uh, certain funding, and that makes logical sense. So they're all different things to to be aware of. Um, one of the things that really is important for companies to understand in that regard is what funding sources are available that relate to their product, so that they can be able to provide that information and help districts who you know bigger districts have people who this is their job is to understand how to access funding. Not mm -hmm. every district has that. And even if they do, there's always changes going on with that stuff. And, or, you know, if you're making them have to figure out 
how does this particular product relate to the different funding sources and have to map that out on, all on their own versus being able to come with that information and, and go to a dialogue so that they can see, okay, we have a way of being able to afford this. Now we just need to decide if it's something that we want. Yeah. Um, and that that makes it a lot easier for them to make that decision versus having to first determine, is this something that we would want? And then say, okay, now do we have any money for it? And you know, lead to the inevitable frustration of, oh, I just spent a bunch of time learning about this product, demoing it, deciding that I want it, and now I can't get it. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, companies can make that a lot easier for them. I think the the funding piece is really important because. I think that there, whenever you talk about money, there's skepticism, but in order to be able to have resources, schools have to access their funding sources. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's just how things work. So, and, and you would hope that, I mean, yes, I'm sure there's a lot of room for improvement with that regard, but it's, it should be tied to, to student achievement and learning and, and things that are things that we'd want to be addressing anyways. So yeah. So, you know, those are the big things, but it's not, it's, it's always a little different everywhere. And um, it ultimately, evidence of efficacy in some regard is yeah. a good starting point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and being able to actually show them that it's going to help them do what they want to do. And, uh, and then go from there. Yeah. So before we wrap up, I wanted to to ask, so what what do we have going on on the B Podcast Network? Um, so I think this interview will be airing. It'll be November around the time that that this will go live. So we've got the Reading is Fundamental series that's going to be live in September, and the episodes will all be available. So what other what other things do we have coming up that yeah, people should know about? Happy Thanksgiving, about? <laughs> everybody. Um, yeah, Thanksgiving break. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my expectation, yeah, certainly with respect to the literacy series is that we'll see some continuation of that throughout the fall and certainly uh, continue to get those episodes out. So anybody out there who's really interested in um, all those conversations about <laughs> the science of reading and bringing joy uh, to reading and, and engagement and, and all of those aspects, um, continue to seek those out. And uh, other than that, I think we will just continue to have a lot of content across every area of education, leadership, teaching and learning in both formal and informal learning environments. So any, any listeners who may be, um, you know, certainly know this show, but, but don't know as much about the other shows, uh, we have shows that are uh, designed for school leaders for teachers, for parents, for uh, corporate learning and development. Um, and so anything that that basically makes a difference around learning uh, and lifelong learning from childhood up to adulthood, there's content around that. And mm -hmm. uh, we aim to continue doing collaborative things where we are able to, to have our hosts sharing with one another and cross-pollinating their audiences because we all um, we all have things that are beneficial to one another uh, but certainly kind of whichever of those groups you fit into as a listener mm -hmm. there's something else out there so yeah a part of our ongoing mission here is to make that content easier to find <laughs> and making it um, more accessible because we know that out there in the the big wide world of podcasting it can be challenging to get tailored relevant recommendations that really mm -hmm. suit what you're looking for right so um that's why we'll continue to to have our hosts share with one another continue to get our our websites updated so that it's just easier to seek out what helps you and uh and just keep doing that and keep getting more great creators involved yeah yeah so where where can people learn more about your shows and some of the work that you're doing Sure. Yeah. So we have uh, bpodcast.network is the website for the network. So that's a good place to kind of browse through through everything. My shows are the Authority Podcast, 
whatever you're listening to this on, you can look for that, or you can go to authoritypodcast.net uh, sideline sessions. Again, any any app that you're listening to this, you can look up sideline sessions, or it's ss.bpodcast.network. Um, and if you're, you know, happen to be on the industry side and you're looking for any help with anything around communications, marketing, or or any kind of other um, strategy for reaching your audiences, my website is at septemberstrat.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I hope this helps people in some yeah. way. <laughs> I hope we Man, have some like good I said, ideas we weren't going to get through all the things. I didn't get through my whole list of questions, but to be continued. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to check the show notes for all the resources that were mentioned in this episode. And be sure to check out the School of Clinical Leadership, my program that helps related service providers put executive functioning support in place in collaboration with their school teams using multiple service delivery models. So I show you how to do direct intervention. And I also show you how to coach and train others so that you can ensure students get support across their day. Remember that it helps me so much if you tell your friends and colleagues about de facto leaders. And if you follow me and leave me a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts, whether you listen on Apple or Spotify or another podcast network. And finally, if you're interested in collaborating with me, if you'd like to invite me to be on your podcast, if you would like to be a guest on de facto leaders, or if you have a suggestion for a guest for de facto leaders, please email me at talk to me at drkarenspeech.com. As always, thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time. <music>